Javier Redondo from uh, University of Zaragoza and uh, start lecturing about dark matter and AI. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, even more to, to um, lecture you or just to, to tell you a little, a little bit about dark matter and, and, um, and about one of my favorite particles soon to be discovered, maybe in 50 years, the action. So um, let me just um, start by, say, by, by telling you what, what should you get from these lectures. Uh, of course, the lectures are on dark matter and on action. So you, at the end of the, the, the lecture, you should be more or less acquainted with the concept of what is dark matter and what are the actions. And uh, there's so much to say about dark matter. Essentially, uh, so if you go to the, to the dictionary and uh, you look for dark matter, you'll find something like non-luminous matter, um, not yet directly detected by astronomers, but that is hypothesized to exist to account for various observed gravitational effects. So in the sense, so exactly what we know about uh, dark matter is that there's some kind of fluid that gravitates, actually. This is not completely true. That is not directly detected. Is the, the gravitational effects of dark matter are precisely what uh, the, the, the effects that are detected. Um, and that is hypothesized. So we will get acquainted with, with, uh, with what, what is this uh, substance that gravitates but we cannot detect. And uh, of course, we'll have to uh, get, get acquainted with, uh, with the idea of, of accents, which are uh, candidates for dark matter. Uh, actually, there's, um, there's a very long story of, uh, of the con concept of dark matter, because astronomers, they tend, they tend to miss uh, uh, a lot of matter. And actually, we have evidence for the existence of this substance that gravitates, but we cannot touch uh, at, uh, at a huge range of scales in the universe. Okay? We have uh, evidence from at the galactic scale. Um, so, so this is at the scale of a few kiloparsecs with the distances that are related to our, gal to, to the, to our galaxy. But also we have uh, evidence of dark matter in cl clusters of galaxies, objects much, much, much bigger that are, uh, we find in the universe containing thousands uh, of, of galaxies. And there we also see these gravitational effects. And also, in the large scale structure of the universe that uh, Kfir was uh, mentioning before and was uh, introducing before, we also see the effects of this uh, mysterious substance. Now, um, the rest of the matter of the universe, the matter that we know is just made of, it's made uh, of the same particles, though I, I, I will try to convince you that it's made of the same particles that we, uh, we know very well because we are made of them and we can play with them in our labs protons, neutrons, uh, some other nuclei, some other atoms, electrons, photons, and neutrinos. So these, uh, these are all particles. And actually, there's, a, there's this uh, observation in nature that essentially everything, that <coughs> everything is particles. Everything is a, so when we, uh, uh, when we want to build a, a theory of um, quantum mechanics and general relativity, we end up all and uh, end up discussing uh, quantum field theories, which are theories of uh, quantum fields, and the excitations of quantum fields are particles. So all the things that we can discuss in nature are essentially uh, particles, uh, unless they are just a funny aspect of a more complicated version of, of general relativity that we don't understand. So the only thing that we cannot matter, uh, that not, uh, we cannot marry with our theories of nature is relativity, right? So if we miss something from relativity, maybe we have to speak about something else, which is, something else which is not particles, like for instance, string theory, right? String theory would be a generalization uh, of, or a marriage between particle physics and general relativity, and there the, the fundamental concepts are tiny strings. But uh, so if this substance is to look like like the normal matter in our universe, it will be made of particles. And this makes the connection with particle physics that, that brings this topic uh, to, this, uh, to this school on particle physics, right? So if we, if we are in the present, if we are wit witnessing the gravitational effects of a collection of particles, uh, it is, so we will be able to learn something about particle physics, or oh, this is our hope. And actually, from the particle physics uh, point of view, it's uh, extremely exciting and very natural uh, that these uh, dark matter effects are observed because uh, in our theories of particle physics that try to extend the standard model of, of particle physics that you studied last week, um, 
we actually very often predict the existence of particles that can be good dark matter candidates. Okay, so, so these particles, these dark matter candidates will be a primary topic of the rest of the lectures, but uh, on this, um, in particular, axions are one of these uh, candidates. But in the, in, in the lecture of today, I just wanted to convince you, or just to give you a flavor of what are the gravitational effects that uh, let us, lead us to think that there is dark matter in the universe. So what are the evidences of dark matter? So I will try to go from the uh, most nearby observations that lead, lead us to think that we have dark matter to the large scale structure. Now, because this, uh, the stage of, of the scales in which uh, we observe dark matter is essentially the, the size of the universe is distinct of the, uh, is the stage of the universe. So I will be overlapping a little bit with the previous lecture, which I think it will, not, it will do no harm because uh, you will hear uh, some things twice and you will see, funny, uh, you will see pictures uh, that uh, in the previous lecture you had to draw in your mind. So let me just first start with um, evidence of, of, of hints of the existence of dark matter from uh, rotation curves of galaxies. So let me just, uh, oh, here you find um, a spiral galaxies. Spiral galaxies are just um, a co um, gravitational, gravitationally bound of, uh, objects made of stars and gas that rotate. And actually the, the gravitational uh, pressure is mostly supported by the centrifugal force of rotation. So this means that the typical, uh, the typical rotation velocity of, of stars is much larger than the velocity dispersion. Okay, so they're really, uh, stars are, are rotating in orbits um, like in a so, sort of a solar system. Now, um, from, the clip, from equating the centrifugal, centrifugal force to the, to the gravitational pull, um, we essentially obtain this relation, right, the centrifugal, centrifugal force on, on a point mass. Let's, let's, talk, or let's think about a star here that is orbiting around the galaxy. The centrifugal, centrifugal force would be m v squared divided by r, the radius and the tangential velocity. And this has to be uh, compensated by the gravitational pull, which is given by all the mass uh, in, inside this, uh, this um, object or this, this ball, essentially, divided by the distance. Um, so what we do um, is, tr uh, essentially, what we do uh, to, to identify uh, dark matter is just to plot the Geschwindigkeit, which means uh, velocity, rotation velocity in, in German, um, as a function of the distance to the center uh, for different stars uh, at different positions, okay? And what we observe is that uh, the rotation uh, velocity increases, uh, then reaches a plateau as a function of distance, even if we uh, go for uh, uh, distances which are farther than the disks of, uh, of galaxies, which is surprising because, uh, I mean, when, um, we expect uh, essentially all the, all the luminous matter which is uh, baryons and gas, is essentially concentrated mostly on, on the disk. So, if, uh, so our expectation from the visible uh, matter that we see from the stars and, and gas would be that when we reach this point, there's not more mass inside of, of this uh, uh, imaginary sphere, and the velocity should go to the square root of uh, Newton's constant times the mass here, so the baryonic mass of the galaxy divided by the distance, so it should decrease with distance, okay? Uh, however, it stays constant. So it, it is like, uh, so we cannot uh, interpret this observation in a number of ways, uh, but uh, we can just postulate the, and this is what, I don't know, many authors have done, and it looks like it's coherent with the rest of the observations, that uh, the amount of matter uh, that uh, these stars uh, suffer when oh, they, they, they feel when they rotate around the galaxy is not only due to the visible matter of the disk and the bulge of the galaxy, but there can be a dark matter component, and here dark means that we cannot see it. Uh, and this dark matter component can extend, can extend uh, further out from the disk, uh, and actually you see that in order to get a rota flat rotation curve, this amount of matter has to be proportional to the distance, okay? Because this is the total mass inside of the sphere. So actually from this, <clears throat> assuming a spherically distributed uh, halo, 
since the mass is the integral of the volume and the density of dark matter, you should get that the density more or less decreases as one over the square root of the, of the radius square. Yeah? Oh, this is the velocity, the, this is the rotation velocity, and this is the distance from the center of the galaxy. Sorry, I was too fast. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, sorry, I, I thought I translated that for you. Yeah. yeah, please ask me every question because yeah, it would be so stupid to, <laughs> uh, to, to uh, miss something for just, but this is the last word in German that I, I'm, I'm showing, sorry. Um, and here you have <laughs> like a small cartoon to guide the eye. So how things uh, behave in a universe in which the, the mass would be only uh, due to the disk or in the universe in which you have also, which is the observed one, in which you have more matter. Good. Uh, so actually this was observed uh, many times, but uh, perhaps the most interesting observation or the most uh, um, influential observation was uh, done by Vera Rubin on uh, M31, the, our, our companion uh, spiral galaxy, the, the, the biggest spiral galaxy that is close to us, uh, and the Androm Andromeda galaxy, where you, I mean, he, she could just uh, measure the velocities of some stars, and also she could measure the velocity of uh, gas clouds that uh, actually extend uh, much farther the disk. So they have a few uh, gas clouds there. And uh, she could also me measure uh, the amount of, of mass, and she could estimate what is the mass enclosed as a function of radius, the cumulative mass from the velocity. And you see that it is actually is growing uh, like, like we show here. Good. Uh, so this has been observed in uh, essentially all, uh, many, well, all of the elliptical galaxies that we, ha that we have measured. Here you have some examples. Actually, and, and even in our Milky Way, in which is more complicated because we are inside, so measuring velocities is, is uh, complicated. But uh, this can be, this has been uh, done even in the inside of our Milky Way at the position of the sun. So this would be the same kind of, of plot that I showed you before, um, but divided by R. And here you have, uh, well, let me just uh, skip, our, uh, skip this. The important thing is that we can also estimate this somehow in our Milky Way, and we can also obtain some um, evidence of, uh, of the necessity of, of uh, dark matter in, uh, in our Milky Way. So this is more or less the summary of this. <clears throat> so in, uh, in the spiral galaxies, we would have the disk, the bulge, and globular clusters, and, and, uh, and gas in a gas cloud of um, hydrogen, okay? That would be the picture of a galaxy, but uh, it looks like a galaxy is surrounded also by some uh, dark halo. Um, and actually, the, the amount of, of dark matter inside of the galaxy is not very much because the velocities of the stars that surround the, uh, the, surround the disk that are just more or less close to the disk are well, rep uh, well reproduced by the, by the amount of mass that we see. But if we go far away, we need uh, to, put, to assume more and more mass, and this, <coughs> this mass it, it reaches a point in which there's more mass in the halo than in, in the luminous matter that we see, okay? So we have more dark matter than matter already at large scales. And also we see that uh, dark matter, by some reason, or this type of dark matter, it does not clump uh, like variants, like the luminous matter into, into galaxies, okay? So it, it has this tendency, instead of uh, uh, falling into the, into the same, uh, Small, uh, uh, small disk, uh, it will stay floating around. See, so it doesn't, doesn't like to clump. So here I just, want, uh, just wanted to mention that uh, there are different interpretations for this observation, and one of them is not, uh, uh, does not pertain to the, um, hy hypothesizing a new kind of particle or a new kind of dark matter, but just changing the, the laws of gravity, okay? Um, this is... Uh, what is called, for, uh, well, uh, just this is, the, this is the most discussed effect, the modified Newtonian dynamics in which um, uh, this gentleman, Mordecai Milgram, just uh, simply stated that uh, normally, so we have tested the second law of, of Newton uh, only at relatively large accelerations, but the accelerations that these stars suffer outside of the Milky Way due to, the, to gravity are so weak that it could be that the second law would fail. And here draw, um, and, and one can just write uh, an, uh, an empirical formula 
that tells you that once, you, once the acceleration goes below a certain, radio, uh, a certain acceleration uh, constant, A0, okay, that's a new constant of the theory, instead of fact, this factor being one and then recovering Newton's law, we would have a suppression by the, by the acceleration divided by this new constant. Okay? So this means that uh, if we do the balance between uh, gravity and centrifugal force in one of these orbits, uh, which is this expression here, in the regime in which we have this suppression, uh, this, the acceleration, uh, which is the centrifugal force, will enter uh, quadratically instead of linearly. And as you see, uh, if you solve this equation, you get that the, uh, that the velocity, <coughs> once the mass is constant, once we, have covered, once we are outside of the, of the halo, oh sorry, of the disk, once we are outside of the baryon disk, we will we'll get a flat rotation curve, okay? And this is because gravity is becoming less effective, if you want. Uh, this, is a <coughs> this is an empirical uh, theory that, uh, uh, however, is supported by some evidence, which is very interesting. Uh, this is the so-called baryonic tally fisher relation that uh, relates the mass of, of, uh, of the galaxy in visible light, so the, the mass that we can really measure and estimate, as a function of the, of the velocity at which the stars seem to move far away from the star. So this plateau of the velocity, okay? The height of the plateau. And you see that actually this corresponds to more or less a power law, and which is actually quite close to four. Uh, and this is precisely the relation that, that is, the, uh, that is, um, that is uh, predicted by this kind of physics. Because now here, you can just forget about dark matter if you want, and this mass is the, is the total mass of the variance in the disk, okay? So the, the stars and the gas. And so you get this, this expression very naturally. Uh, this is just an empiric formula, but there are also relativistic generalizations. Uh, however, this is a particle physics school, so I'm not going to dwell very much on, on these modifications of, of uh, general relativity, which is not my subject. Uh, just, uh, I just wanted to tell you that uh, even if uh, at galactic scales, uh, these kind of theories seem to actually fit better observations than dark matter, on occasion, uh, they seem to fail to explain other evidences for dark matter in the universe. So you have to keep uh, this in mind for, for the rest of the lecture. But at least it's nice to know that there are some uh, very colorful uh, alternatives to dark matter on some scales. So let me just move uh, to uh, another evidence that comes from uh, slightly far away. So these are not just uh, the, this, the, the velocity at which um, stars move around this, uh, galaxies, but um, the velocities, or we are going to study the velocities at which galaxies move when they are gravitationally bound, like in a solar system of, um, of galaxies. So these are the so-called uh, clusters of galaxies, and here you have a picture uh, of the coma cluster, which is, uh, uh, is a, a group of, of galaxies that is gravitationally bound, so they are uh, orbiting around each other, and uh, they are very far away, 100, 100 parsecs, something like that, but not very far away for, for the standards that you are uh, now going to get used to, but relatively far away. And you have more or less something like 1,000 galaxies. And this gentleman here, Fritz Zwicky, um, Swiss, uh, Swiss born but uh, working in the US, uh, decided to study the dynamics of this uh, set of galaxies uh, using a very uh, um, approximate expression, which is called the Brial theorem. That, that relates the kinetic energy of a closed system with the potential energy of a closed, uh, of a closed system, okay? Uh, essentially, the, the, the Birial theorem tells you that if you have um, yeah, a system of particles interacting with each other, uh, in this case, gravitationally, um, if you do a, a long enough time average of, of the kinetic energy of the whole system, which is the kinetic energy of the galaxies, right? And the potential energy, okay, the, so when you're far away, you have a large potential energy. Uh, this, this relation should hold, okay? Now this, uh, if you just very crudely assume that all galaxies have more or less the same mass and they will have some velocity spread, so you can, you can estimate the kinetic energy by this formula and you can estimate the potential energy by the total mass 
uh, the mass of one, uh, one galaxy and the typical distance between them. So as you see, the formula looks very similar to the, I mean, uh, the, the, the equality uh, is, looks very similar to the one that we found for rotation of uh, course of galaxies because the, sa the same physics holds. At the end, what we are, uh, yeah, uh, what, what we are telling is that uh, kinetic energies and um, kinetic energies and potential energies are related. And in this case of self gravitating systems, the physical picture is that if you have a, a few stars that uh, are gravitationally bound and they move slowly, uh, so you have a few stars, so your potential well will not be very deep, and the, the stars can only move relatively slowly. Right? If you want to contain uh, star, uh, galaxies that move faster, you have to put more of them to, to lower the gravitational uh, potential. Right? So you always have these uh, clusters in this typology. Large velocities, you, have, you need a huge amount of mass, huge amount of galaxies. Low velocities, you can uh, keep with a small number of galaxies. And this gives you a way to connect the velocity dispersion of galaxies with the total mass. So let us just do the exercise, first of all. So we, uh, <coughs> we can measure, so how can we uh, arrange this calculation? Because now these objects are very far away. Um, so you know that the radial velocity, so first of all, we know uh, that uh, due to the expansion of the universe, this actually, the coma cluster is, is uh, expanding from us. So if we look at the, the redshift of the light uh, coming from these galaxies, uh, we, we, all, we see that the, all these galaxies are uh, going away from us. Uh, and uh, essentially, we cannot measure the velocities which are tangential to our line of sight. Here we, here we are, okay, and here's the coma cluster. The distance is huge, and these galaxies, they seem to look to, to recede from us. Then we can measure very nicely these velocities with the, uh, with the redshift, but not the tangential ones because uh, the, the galaxies do not move very much because they are so far away. Now, however, what we can do is, because we know uh, how the universe is expanding, uh, uh, we, we, you have already heard about this, the, the velocities at which the galaxies are expanding from us are uh, proportional to the distance, and we know this relation for a relatively close object like the coma cluster. So we can obtain uh, the, the average velocity at which this cluster is receding from us, and we can subtract this velocity from uh, from, the, from the, all, all the velocities, and when we subtract that, we see that uh, some velocities are just coming back and some velocities are going through, uh, to the center of the cluster. So we see some more or less, some distribution of, veloc of radial velocities which is distributed around zero, right? And now, and, and this distribution we can measure. Now the idea is um, we will assume that uh, the, galaxy, the, the velocities in the, in the cluster are more or less isotropically distributed. So the, the, the velocity dispersion that we see in the radial velocities, we will assume also in the tangential plane, okay? So we can estimate the typical dispersion velocity, the typical velocity with respect to the center of mass by just doing these assumptions. And uh, yeah, exactly. And um, the last thing that we have to do you see that there are many, many uh, assumptions here. We have to estimate the mass of all the galaxies. Measuring the mass, uh, the, for, for measuring the mass of a galaxy, um, uh, we don't have so many, well, we have some, some means of doing this, but uh, actually uh, for, for us it suffices to just consider uh, an average of the luminosities, so uh, yeah, um, an average luminosity uh, per galaxy, okay? So if, if we have many galaxies in our cluster, uh, we know that what is the average uh, luminosity for a typical galaxy, and we just take an average, and from this we can estimate the amount of mass in galaxies. So, okay, so the idea is, so the idea is that when Fritz Frick, uh, Fricki did that, he observed something like this. So he, um, he measured the velocities, so you have these arrows more or less, and he knew the number of uh, galaxies and the number uh, and the average mass of a galaxy, if you want. So he can estimate that. But actually with this potential, so with the mass he estimated, the velocity should have to be, uh, should be much, much smaller. So then he, he uh, ended up concluding that actually uh, there should be some extra matter in the cluster that makes the potential well so deep that, you can, that, he, uh, that he can keep the uh, um, galaxies with a large, larger velocity, okay? 
So this was the, the conclusion. And actually, uh, I am here, here it is, sorry. Ah, oh, no, I didn't write it. So essentially, he found something like uh, the, the amount of mass that you needed it was something like 100 times, 100 times larger than the mass that he estimated from the galaxies, OK? 100 times. Now, there's an, there are more sophisticated ways uh, to, to measure uh, the mass and the velocity dispersion nowadays. Uh, Fitzsimmons did this uh, many years ago. And uh, one of the most interesting is just um, using the X-ray emission from these galaxy clusters. So let me just uh, go back. Um, oh, no. I don't have this. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I, I didn't write it. Sorry. Uh, so the typical, uh, typical velocity that we have in this cluster for, for the galaxies that are moving is actually quite high. And uh, this means that if baryons are in, uh, so the, the, the gas clouds that are uh, between the galaxies, they are going to also move at the same velocity, okay? But now if you, if you have <coughs> gas clouds that are moving at a very fast velocity, you can estimate what is the typical kinetic energy. And the typical kinetic energy of a, of a proton, which is the typical component of a gas, is of the order of the keV, okay? A kilo electron volt. So this means oh, uh, several keV, actually. Uh, so this means that these this, um, protons, when they collide, so when, when they meet each other, they can radiate energies, they can radiate photons of the order of keV, actually. And uh, actually, they, they, I mean, they, they collide and they form a plasma because these KV energies are enough to ionize all the neutral, all the neutral particles in a plasma. So this, this, uh, the gas in, a, in the interior of a globular cluster is completely ionized by these collisions and by the high energy photons. And what you see here is a, is a picture from an X-ray satellite looking at the coma cluster. And you see uh, essentially in the, here the, the amount of photons in the, in the range from uh, 0.5 to 2 KV. Okay, so you see actually this plasma uh, emitting X-rays. Now, the typical velocity of particles in a plasma is related with, uh, in a thermalized plasma is related with the temperature, right? So actually, <clears throat> if, we, if we manage to model the temperature of this plasma and we, we have the emission, right? So we, from the emission, we can just uh, compute the density of this plasma and the temperature, just making, looking at the spectrum and looking at different lines. And from the temperature, we will, a, we, will be able to, we will be able to estimate the velocity dispersion of typical particles. And this shall be the same of, of, the, of the galaxies, because, both, because all these particles are just moving in the same gravitational potential. So we will know a, a veloc uh, so we will know the velocity, the typical velocities in the pla in, in this gas of now uh, um, protons and, and um, helium atoms and other uh, and other uh, and other uh, ions, uh, but also we will know it as a function of distance because we can make a very nice map of the of the luminosity. So we can make a map of the temperature. So we can actually look at the distribution of of the velocities. And then, uh, just using the, the uh, again the, the Burial theorem, we can now measure the mass that is enclosed by spheres of increasing radius from this center. Okay, by just using that the, the total mass is responsible for, for the gravity and is responsible for the uh, velocity dispersion. And by doing this on the coma cluster and uh, many other clusters, we actually find uh, that uh, we find uh, more mass. We find that we need uh, more mass than the one that uh, that we can that we can see from the from the gas uh, that we can measure from the gas. And actually, we can make a account for the coma cluster. Most of the mass actually. Is in uh, is in this in this gas of baryons. Okay, so th this is one of the reasons why Zwicky got a factor of got a factor of hundred uh, more mass than he he could see. Uh, a factor of ten is, is more or less accounted by the fact that actually uh, in the coma cluster most of the mass is in the in the form of this gas of cloud that is emitting X rays. Okay, but still. Uh, 
what we see is that the amount of, of, uh, of baryonic matter that comes from this, uh, this uh, analysis of the temperature is only 15% uh, of the total mass that one needs to keep the gas uh, in, uh, gravitationally bound by the Virial theorem. Actually, one often hears this sentence that hot baryons would escape from the cluster uh, without dark matter. Because you have so, if you, if you take the 85% the of the dark matter, the potential well now lifts up, and all these particles are very fast. They, are, they have very large energy, so they would just escape. Okay, that's another very nice hint of the existence of some kind of cold dark matter. Uh, but we can also estimate, we can also measure the mass uh, in a cluster, and, and this time exactly the mass directly by just uh, using gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing is uh, essentially the, the phenomenon that occurs when, uh, when a, some object that is emitting light uh, senses light rays, and the light rays uh, pass relatively close to a gravitational length, which is just some amount of mass. Then the light rays get deflected, and uh, you see multiple images, or you, you see a distortion of, of this pattern of, of light, light rays compared with not having this foreground, foreground galaxy. There are three types of, of gravitational lensing. This is just for your information. This is this strong lensing. When there's a lot of matter concentrated in between the observer and the, and, the, and the object that we are observing, you can see, actually, you can make a picture. You can see multiple images of the same object. There's a, vari a weak variation of a strong lensing in which, actually, uh, the observer uh, looks a very fluffy distribution of matter, and therefore, it only sees very small distortions in the picture. It doesn't see multiple images. It's like it, all these multiple images are just together, but uh, and which give you to a, some kind of a distorted image. And actually, this is what you see here, for instance. So you take a, a pattern of of, uh, of ellipsoids of galaxies that we would see as, as ellipsoids, and you just put uh, a distribution of matter like a globe. The, gravitational potential of a globular, uh, globular uh, sorry, of a cluster of galaxies, and you would see these small distortions, okay? So no big distortions, but statistically, one can just uh, work out <coughs> from these distortions, one can work out the, the distribution of, of matter. There's also some interesting uh, different form of, of um, a different type of lensing, which is what we call microlensing, which does not consist on uh, um, looking at this, at this screen and looking at distortions of the images caused by the, by the lens, by the gravitational lens. Uh, it is actually what is used to, um, to measure the effects of very small lenses. And very small lenses would have a very, uh, so very, if you have a lot, uh, if you have, sorry, if you have very little mass, the distortions in the, in the picture are so small that you cannot resolve it. You, you would need a fantastic, amazingly good uh, CCD camera and very long exposures. So this doesn't work. However, what you can do is the following. You just take a telescope and you just po point to a star uh, that is more or less stable in luminosity. And you just measure the light that it comes to you as a function of time. And you have a, a figure <laughs> which looks like this, but uh, actually with, with numbers that you can see. This is the luminosity, so the flux that you get from this star as a function of time. No? And if nothing happens, you should see that this luminosity is just constant. Maybe there's some atmospheric perturbation, whatever. But you can, you can model for this constancy, constancy of, of this line. But then imagine that you have something uh, now, very small compact object that goes very close to the line of sight between the observer and the star. Now, like a black hole, for instance, or like a um, brown dwarf or a small star that you cannot see. When it gets very close to the line of sight, you would have some distortion like this, right? You cannot see it. But the main effect is that actually some light that was going to go to infinity, now it, it is coming, uh, so it, it is deflected by the, by the mass and goes into your detector, OK? So this is when, when, when you are exactly in the center, the lens increases the number of photons that reach your detector. So you see an increase in luminosity and then a decrease when the, when the object uh, passes by. So this, of course, happens not, not only if the, if the object go, crosses exactly your line of sight, but if, if, if also if it goes a little bit above or below. So there's some range uh, and there's some characteristic shape of this 
enhancement of luminosity as a function of the mass of this part uh, of this object and a function of the impact parameter with your line of sight. So you can also, and this will, will be used to, to search for uh, dark matter as well, microlensing. Okay, but here with, uh, with uh, so to study the classes of, of galaxies, we use weak lensing. So we look at background galaxies lensed by our um, cluster of galaxies, okay? And from this, uh, the, from the distortions of the background, as I saw, show you here, we can reconstruct the amount of mass that is around the line of sight. So we have some degeneracy, but we can say uh, how, how much matter was from, from infinity, so in this globular cluster, from infinity until us, okay? Infinity means um, <laughs> here, and us means here. So this is more or less a reasonably cutoff. And you see, uh, so it, it works very, it works relatively nicely. So you don't have a, a fantastic resolution, but it uh, it gives you nice pictures uh, of the distribution of matter. And what do this? So here you have a, a three-dimensional um, density plot of this of uh, something like this distribution, in which you see the the mass per unit area. Okay. So this is, we cannot get the density as a function of three dimensions. We only get the projection into one plane. So this is mass per unit area uh, in, uh, as a function of these two angles, these two coordinates. And you see uh, here uh, the uh, peaks. These peaks correspond to galaxies, and you can, map, uh, you can map them very well. So you see, you can reconstruct even the gravitational potential of the mass of, this, of these galaxies. But you also see, uh, a smooth component that is actually quite important. And uh, so again, you can, just, you can just integrate this curve and, and uh, tell how, mu so how much mass do you have in this smooth component. And you can compare that with the estimate of the mass of variance that you see from X-rays and from uh, the average galaxy, galactic luminosity, okay? Well, actually, you can now, nowadays, weight the galaxies much better than with the average. And you, uh, so once you do this, you get again that the total baryon uh, mass divided by the total mass. Now the total mass is given by lensing, yep. So usually what's the size of the Venn of tail compared to one of the galaxies? Uh, so this, this more or less was uh, coming in the, when we talk about galaxies. So you, you, you have here that, um, a typical galaxy, like our galaxy, is something like 20 kiloparsec, 20 kiloparsec. And the size of the galactic halo um, that we can see more or less clear, well, actually, so the answer is very simple. We actually, we don't see, we don't see very clearly where the dark matter halos end. So that's why, actually, I put this picture, I forgot to tell you, that uh, we have two galaxies, and the, <clears throat> the dark matter halos, at some point, they, they seem to overlap. So there's no, yeah. Although observations here are super complicated because we need something that we can measure the velocity and, and these regions are typically quite empty. So in the same, yeah, as it, uh, uh, the same that you, I wanted to tell you in this picture, you can see now, uh, in, in, at least inside of a, dense globular uh, uh, of a dense cluster of galaxies, because you see here that uh, yeah, the, dark mo the, the density of dark matter doesn't go to zero between two galaxies, right? So we, yeah. So we learn again that uh, the dark matter is distributed extensively and doesn't produce peaks. So these peaks are all entirely due to galaxies. Uh, it's smoothly distributed, unlike the variants that form the galaxies. And the total mass, the, bari the baryonic mass divided by the total mass is something like 15%. And we have something very interesting uh, also from global, uh, sorry, from, I'm going to say global cluster 100 times today, uh, from clusters of galaxies, which is that we can observe, uh, we, we observe sometimes when, um, events when two of these globular clusters uh, collide, okay? Globular clusters are also <clears throat> found from time to time in larger collections of, uh, these are called superclusters. They are clusters of, uh, clusters of galaxies. Uh, so sometimes they, they feel enough attraction towards each other that they just simply uh, attract each other and they collide. And this is what you have here. Uh, this is the, a picture of, of what, <laughs> probably the most famous collision of, of uh, clusters, which is called uh, the Ballet Cluster. You don't see very much, but, <laughs> but you have to see that here. 
uh, you have a small cluster, and here you have a larger cluster okay, of galaxies. Each of these uh, points, uh, essentially, in this ellipse is, is, a, is a gal I think, this knot. And probably, no, the, the big round things are field galaxies or field something. The galaxies are uh, these more, more elliptical things. Uh, and um, here you have a map. So first of all, you have the, 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 yeah, the clusters here and here. You have the image from weak lensing that tells you what is the amount of mass right, per unit area is, uh, again, depicted in uh, blue. That's why also I, which I'm not, uh, who I'm not an astronomer, know that the clusters are here. So this is where the, all the mass is, is concentrated. And what we see here in, in green is just the map from X-rays, okay? So uh, what has happened is that uh, you can imagine a, a, a cluster of galaxies coming from here in this direction, another cluster coming from here in this direction, and what has happened is that uh, while so the, the, uh, the galaxies are very small compared to, so to each other, so they, are, they typically don't, they don't collide, so they go through, okay? That's why we, ha we, have, we see here the galaxies. But the gas that is uh, surrounding these galaxies is very strongly interacting. You have very small particles and they are charged. So when you, you collide to clouds of gas, what happens is that by friction, it, 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 you, you feel the friction, it heats up and it emits uh, more light, but it stays in the, same, uh, in the same position, in the position of the co collision more or less, because it has friction, right? So each, each of the particles of, of the one cloud of gas now is, is going to scatter through the, or the particles of the other gas, gas cloud. So they, they slow down each other. Uh, and this is, yeah, essentially, and now you, uh, now you know that most of, the, most of the matter actually in, in, a, in a cluster is due to this uh, dark matter component. So actually, you, what you see here now is the contribution from the dark matter plus the galaxies, which are not so very important, right? I told you before that they were even at 10%, in the case of coma, 10% of the total variance is in the galaxies. So most of the mass is here, mass here, and the gas is here. So you have another proof that, act, that the mass of a cluster of galaxies is not in the gas. It's in, in, in the dark matter. Oh, yeah, here, here's another picture as a contours of uh, mass distribution versus temperature. And uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, an animation. You can guess what uh, each thing is by the coloring code. These two clusters are colliding. You, have, you see the, 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 um, the shock wave uh, when the two plasmas collide. And uh, the, you see how it gets, it's really getting hotter. But uh, galaxies and the matter distribution doesn't care. They just follow the gravitational evolution. This, this was for you to, so if you couldn't picture the, the dynamics with my explanations, uh, you, might have, uh, you might have now a, a better picture. So, so what we have question. learned from clusters, first of all, that, that it looks like the total mass. Question. Oh. Do we have the train rack cluster where the opposite happens? Sorry? Like, do, do we have the train rack cluster where the opposite happens? The opposite means? Um, there's a cluster called Trin Abel 520. If mm -hmm. you, like, but the two, two clusters collide together. The dark matter stay in the middle, but the matter separate out. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't know, I don't know about this cluster, sorry. But uh, <coughs> I will check it out, and I'll tell you what I think about it. Sorry. Um, yeah. So we have, other, we have many other examples of this, valid of this valid type of clusters, but also some examples in which uh, actually dark matter seems to stay in the center and the gas flows away. So we'll, we'll tell you something about this. Okay, so we have learned uh, something about the dark matter distribution at the scales of galaxies and at the scales of uh, clusters of galaxies. Now, uh, it's, uh, it's, we, can, uh, we can obtain some more information about the dark matter just from the large scale structure of the universe, and in particular, from the expansion rate of the universe. Now I'm going to necessarily collide with, uh, with, the preview, with, uh, with Kfir, but I think repeating is only good. Um, so we are going to use the expansion of the universe to weight uh, the universe, okay? Uh, and uh, the, the, this, this weighting procedure will give us the amount of dark matter relative to, to variance. So we have to go through some steps 
uh, you know very well, uh, now you know the, the face of uh, Edwin Hubble and uh, the, the law that he found, uh, in which when we, we, he was looking at very distant objects, they seem to uh, be receding from us, going away from us uh, with a velocity that is proportional to the distance. You know it very well. Uh, this was a problem. Oh, no. there's, a, always a pro um, there's always a conflict in, in uh, human science with this cosmological principle of uh, thinking that we are at the center of the universe. It's very funny to, to, to think that uh, objects are uh, going far away from us. And the resolution of this paradox, because we are all feeling much better if we are not the center of the universe nowadays, that we have learned that we, I mean, we have learned so many times that we are not the center of the universe. So this led to these uh, simple models of the universe expansion, okay, where all the points are separating from each other just equally well. So everything is very democratic and uh, all points the same. So yeah, as you, 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 uh, you see here in this cartoon, um, the universe uh, expanding, okay, and uh, the size of this universe or the size between two galaxies that would not feel force between them uh, is, uh, will be increasing, and this uh, can be characterized by a scale factor that I'm not going to call A because calling A a scale factor is a very bad, uh, is a very bad um, thing to do in, in a lecture in which we are going to talk about axioms because the axion field will be just described by A. So I have to reserve my A for the axion and then the scale factor with the R here, which has also the, the, the interpretation of a kind of a radius, something like this. So something that you have heard also this morning, uh, but in a different way. Um, actually, this, this continues a little bit the lecture uh, beforehand, is that uh, so one can just uh, essentially uh, use general relativity to uh, study the dynamics of this scale factor. So just making uh, um, an ansatz on the, on the universe that is homogeneous and isotropic, one can write the most general metric which is uh, yeah, the function that describes how to measure things in this universe. And uh, general relativity is a theory that describes gravity, gravitational interactions, as a function of the dynamics of this metric. Now this metric is just what you have also seen in the, uh, in the morning. Uh, it gives you the time, uh, proper time intervals, like in special relativity. And what I'm writing here is essentially what uh, Kiffer has written this, uh, this morning. So the metric in my homogeneous and isotropic universe uh, is just uh, delta t squared, so minus, or the line element is delta t squared minus, this would be the delta r squared in commoving coordinates. My commoving coordinates are the ones uh, that are, that I'm, I'm changing as the universe expands, I'm dividing by the expansion factor, so the, uh, the, the distance between two objects in commoving coordinates stays the same, okay? I, I'll, I'll have a better cartoon now. And, and, the, and the distance is only uh, expanded by this factor here. Now, if you plug this in general relativity, or if you do the trick that uh, Kafir is going to do uh, tomorrow, uh, you'll find that actually the equations of general relativity, of course, they tell you the dynamics of gravity. They tell you how gravity evolves. They tell you how the, the only dynamical parameter that we have allowed our universe uh, to have evolves in time. And actually find this uh, beautiful relation between uh, the, expansion, the expansion factor, so the, derivative, the time derivative of the scale factor divided by the scale factor squared is proportional to the energy density of the universe. So if you have more energy density, the universe has to span fa faster, you have less, it spans slower. So this tells you the dynamical connection between the geometry of the universe, which is the, <laughs> the scale factor, in this case it's a very simple geometry, geometry in, in, in three plus one dimension, and the energy density, the energy content of the universe. And remember, we want to, so we have, we have uh, a good guess, or we have a hint that there is a missing ingredient in the, in the universe, and precisely the missing ingredient is mass, right? So mass in a volume is density, so good. It looks like we, we will be able to uh, weight the energy density by measuring the expansion factor. So uh, yeah, here's a, here comes a, a, another explanation of redshift, but now in pictures. So the idea is very simple. Once you accept that this, the, the universe is expanding homogeneously and the distances are only scaling by the, uh, by the scale factor, imagine that you uh, emit, so yeah, here you have uh, the commoving coordinates, by the way. 
So the commoving coordinates are staying the same. So this would be 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. And points in 0, 0, if you don't do anything, the point at 0 stays at 0. But however, the distance, physical distance between these are, is expanding. So now imagine that I, I emit a, a train of waves with a wavelength that is one centimeter uh, at this time. And the universe expands, of course, this, I mean, this wave is an extended object and it's going to, it's going to travel, why not? But the distance uh, between, the, be, between the crests of the wave is a, is a, is a distance that is well-defined in the frame of reference, in this moving frame of reference, and it's going to expand with the scale factor as well. So that when the universe has expanded uh, threefold, this wavelength will expand it threefold. Okay, this is uh, why we see gravitational redshift when we, look, uh, when we look back in time. So the wavelength observed today, of course, is uh, divided by the wavelength emitted is the scale factor today, but we will take one, Kefir uh, commands, and the, and the scale factor when it was emitted. Um, so yeah, redshift is always Redshift is always defined as, uh, as this uh, observed minus emitted wavelength divided by, by emitted. So this is the definition of redshift. And actually, we can interpret the, uh, remember that the, the radial velocities in, the, in Hubble law, they are actually measured not as velocities. We cannot measure velocities. We measure the redshift. Well, we can measure velocities, but not, not the very long distances. The velocities at long distances, we measure as, as redshifts, OK? So there's this redshift and velocity relation. And uh, Hubble, Hubble's law, therefore, is not a, so uh, at large distances, at least, uh, empirically, is a relation between the redshift of the light we observe uh, uh, as a function of distance. Hubble's, con uh, but you all know these things. And uh, a very important thing is that we can actually parameterize uh, time uh, in the universe, so that this time we can parameterize it with different with different parameters. We can use time, but we can also use the scale factor. That would be uh, so. The, the a given time will be the time at which the scale factor was r. But also we can use the redshift, which means uh, so the the redshift that we will observe today, if uh, at this given time somebody would emit. Uh, a given a given uh, photon. Okay, so these are three different ways of uh, of measuring time in in this simple universe. So I just wanted to uh, to explain a little bit more. I don't know if I'm go uh, going to collide too much with Kefir. Actually, um, how you get uh, Hubble's law uh, from from this uh, uh, from this picture, and the idea is um, how do we me uh, how do we measure a distance, right? which is very far away. So the idea is, again, uh, he has already said that we are going to use a standard candle, an object from which we know what is the amount of energy that emits at a given time. So we know that an object uh, emits light with a given luminosity at a given redshift here. OK? These are these. So it's, emitted, it's emitting uh, homogeneously here, so isotropically, a boost of energy. And the, the universe expands, this wave front is expanding, right? Uh, so the flux that we, read, that, that we see today is, is, given by this, um, is, is given by this expanded flux. Of course, the number of photons between these two lines is conserved as the, as the universe expands. The number of photons is conserved. Um, oh, sorry. Well, let me just, uh, yeah. So it, it, the flux that we observe is just essentially the luminosity divided by the distance, right, normally. So this uh, allows us to define what we call a luminosity distance, which is just essentially taking this, dis so, uh, taking this distance from this formula and writing, we are going to estimate the distance from the luminosity divided by the flux. And the idea is that the flux we can measure is the number of photons per unit time, uh, per unit area that I write to my detector. But the luminosity and the luminosity, I have to guess. Okay, I'm going to use objects that always have the same luminosity, and that's why I will be able to to know this. Uh, yeah. So the idea. Now let me just uh, come back to this uh, to this thing. So the flux of the number of photons in this um, in this region, it has converted to the num uh, to the same number of photons, but now in a much bigger region. So essentially, 
the, this luminosity distance uh, has to change because, the, because the, the flux is going to change, right? So the flux is going to change uh, as the universe expands for two reasons. Not because the number of photons has changed, but because now this, um, the, yeah, because they are now spread in a much bigger region, okay? And the, right? So this is essentially tells you that the delta T that is going to take to these photons to arrive here is longer now. And it has increased by the scale factor. So now all the photons that are going to arrive to my detector, they are going to take a longer time. Uh, but also, the energy of each photon is going to decrease because the wavelength of a photon has increased when the universe expanded. So this energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So you have that, the, that this distance, we know that it has to be essentially the, the commoving um, radius, okay, the, the thing that hasn't changed, but also uh, expanded by these two factors. Um, and now, essentially, it's very easy. So um, the distance is proportional to this, the commoving distance between us and, and, and the star, which is just, in this example, four, okay? Multiplied by the, by the redshift. And here, the idea is essentially that we, that we can express the, the distance be, uh, for the time interval, just uh, as uh, Skiffy was doing before. The moving distance very close to us, so I'm going to use this expression, I'm going to derive this expression only for more or less local uh, observers, so the, the universe hasn't expanded so much. So the commuting distance is more or less like the, in units of uh, the speed of light equals to one, is the time interval between emission and, and, and uh, detection. But then if I expand my scale factor uh, at, at the time of emission in powers of, uh, of, the, of the time, right, I can just get the first um, one plus the deri time derivative of the scale factor times the di distance between uh, today and, uh, and uh, the time of emission. And uh, of course, the redshift at the time of emission, sorry, the scale factor is just by definition one over one plus redshift. So I can just express this time interval as the inverse of the Hubble constant. So I get essentially just from this, exp just from this expansion uh, this uh, trivial expansion, I get that the distance, it has to be inversely proportional to the, to the Hubble scale, and then I get that the redshift is proportional to the distance. And the distance here, now you, you know exactly what it means, is the distance that I have estimated with this standard candle, okay? So this is the Hubble law uh, that maybe you get another expression. So the idea is um, now that the Hubble constant, that is this, this slope in the Hubble law, is actually not constant. Uh, why? Because remember that this constant here, it appears, uh, whoop, this Hubble constant is, oh, sorry. The Hubble, this Hubble parameter is the, is the time derivative of the scale factor today, divided by the scale factor today, which is one. But General relativity tells us that the scale factor is actually proportional to the energy density of the universe. And the energy density of the universe cannot stay constant uh, as a function of time. Because when I compress in this commoving frame, when I compress galaxies, right? So the, the, num the number in, in, in the commoving volume, they stay the same because nothing's changing. But the, but the scale factor is changing, right? So the physical distance is changes. So if you have a density of matter today, a given density of matter today, if I compress the volume, so if I go to scale factors which are very small, this density is going to increase, the physical density. And also the same will happen with the radiation. So if I, if I take a box of photons and I compress it by, by a scale factor R, the, <coughs> the density of photons is going to increase by one over R cubed. And each of, these, each of these photons is now, has a, uh, now a shorter wavelength, so it has more energy. So, and, and exactly the, 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 the amount of energy that it has extra is the is factor of the expansion of the universe. As again, uh, so you get a factor of R to the four. And the universe is, we have radiation in the universe, as you have heard from, the, from, as you know very well, and we have matter in the universe, as you know very well. So 
the Hubble constant is not constant. So the idea is um, to try to measure this relationship uh, between the redshift and the, dis uh, the luminosity distance in such a way that we can uh, <coughs> observe variations of, uh, of uh, the Hubble constant. But now um, note that the Hubble constant is going to dep depend on these different compositions of the universe. So uh, here I'm assuming a very simple universe, but actually it works super nicely to think that the universe is made of matter that you can compress and expand and uh, red shifts like this. Radiation that, uh, that uh, increases its energy as uh, the red shift to the fourth power. When you, so when you go back in time, you compress the universe uh, and the radiation gets more energetic. So this will be any, so the density of radiation will increase with the fourth root of your, in, of your compression. And also we need a cosmological constant, an ugly thing. Um, some notational um, mm, break here. So normally, instead of talking about uh, energy densities, we often uh, use um, a normalized version of energy densities with, uh, with what we call the critical density, which in my, in my lectures is going to be essentially the same as the total density of the universe. Uh, if, you, if I just use this, this expression and I take this factor here with a Newton constant and I put it, put it down here, that then I, have a, I can define a, a density, which is three times h squared by three gn. So all the density of the universe is this critical density is given by this. So I can just define my omega, omega parameter as the ratio of the density of each of these ingredients divided by the total or critical density. And then Friedman's equation, it, it becomes uh, very simple. One equals the sum of all the omegas. And uh, you can write also the, Hub, uh, the Hubble parameter now as a function. So you can just, uh, this is just a bit of massaging with these equations. Um, you can write it as the omegas today. Lambda is a constant, so it's, it's the same. The density of, of cosmological constant is a constant, so you can just evaluate it whenever you want. The, the matter density you evaluated today, and then in the pre, at high redshifts, so when the universe was younger and smaller, this increases by a factor of, uh, of redshift Q, right? It's the inverse of this factor, and radiation with a redshift to the four. So you see that uh, Hubble depends on these omega parameters, right? Uh, in general, we can, we, first we have to write this equation that we have already seen I think in, 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 the, in the previous slides. But first of all, let me just tell you about what is going to be the choice of our uh, standard candle. The, the object that we are going to look at and we know that uh, we can trust that the, we understand uh, luminosity. So the, one of the optimal candidates, uh, or the ones that I'm going to use, because they, I mean, they are reasonably standard, are supernovas of type one. So supernova of time, type one, they form, um, I want to explain you why we think, so or why they tend to have all, all the same luminosity, uh, because it's nice physics. So a white, um, so a two supernova type one, we think that it happens uh, in the following circumstances. So we have, a, when, we have, when we have a low mass star, low mass stars, they can, um, they evolve just fusing light nuclei like protons into, uh, into helium, and then helium into carbon, and then uh, carbon into oxygen, and so on. But uh, in order to, pr uh, to burn uh, higher elements, you need more pressure, you need more temperature, because the, the Coulomb repulsion between the nuclei is stronger. So you need to push stronger to, to, to burn uh, heavy elements. And if you have a, a, a star which is uh, smaller than 1.44, no, sorry, uh, if you have a, no, no, Forget about that. If you, have, if you have a relatively low mass star, they cannot reach the point of igniting carbon. Um, they cannot ignite carbon or uh, oxygen, and then you get a star, which is a dead star that cannot produce any nuclear reactions anymore, which is most, uh, more or less entirely made of carbon and oxygen. And uh, these stars end up, end up being so, so they, they end up being so dense because they have radiated all the energy, all the temperature. They are not very hot. And they get compressed until the Fermi degeneracy pressure stabilizes them. 
okay? So that they, they cannot get more compressed because then, because the electrons don't, don't like to be in the same uh, state, right? They don't like to, to be in the same momentum state or if you want in position, you, you cannot compress two electrons with the same spin to put them very closely. So this, uh, or at least uh, not, unless you, you pull them very strongly. Um, so the, there's a limit to, so, okay. And then these white dwarf stars, they end up being uh, um, of the order of one uh, solar mass, something like this, and then, or, or lower, and then they die. They stay there for the rest of their lives. Unless they have a nice companion that can fit them with some, some more matter. And then what happens is what you see more or less in this picture, you have this white dwarf star in a binary system, uh, and it's uh, accreting. Uh, you have a blue giant I'm here, and matter is, is very loosely gravitationally bound to this star, so by tidal effect, you can, uh, the, the white dwarf can just steal uh, some matter uh, to the companion, and therefore, slowly, this white dwarf star can increase its mass from a, from a valley which is relatively small and growing, growing. And there's a limit to the, to the stability of this star which is given by the generosity pressure. So a star which is bigger than the Chandrasekha limit, 1.44 solar masses, Will, collapse, will, will recombine uh, electrons with protons, will try to form a neutron star. So um, we'll do something like this. So a star which is, uh, yeah, all the, new, uh, all the white dwarfs have to, be, uh, have to have a mass smaller than this 1.44. So what happens is that um, as the white dwarf increases its mass, it's getting closer and closer to the Chandrasekhar limit. And just before it increases, uh, over, the, over this limit and converts into a black hole, something like this. Something miraculous happens. I think when, when you get 99 of this limit or 90 something of this limit, you can suddenly, so uh, the, the star mass is sufficient to start burning carbon. And this happens um, relatively fast. You start burning carbon in some places, you start burning o oxygen, and then the, the, the nuclear uh, energy that you're producing hits the star, produces a chain reaction. <laughs> Uh, in which uh, uh, um, nuclei have a lot of temperature and they can, uh, they can start to produce even higher nuclei. The amount of energy released is, is humongous and the star explodes or something. Like, so the amount of energy released in one second is uh, the, the amount of luminosity, I don't know, of one entire galaxy or something like this. And it's released in one second, so the star, expl the star explodes and having produced also heavy, heavy elements. And why are all these stars very similar? Because they all happen to explode. So all these stars, they happen to explode when they have very similar masses, okay? Because they have been reaching there by accreting mass from the companion, and, uh, and this uh, carbon burning uh, miracle before converting into a black hole or something like this, it happens just at the same, so, uh, at the same value of the mass. So all these explosions are very similar, relatively similar. And also they have, um, so after the explosion, which we can see very nicely, uh, you have all the heavy elements produced, you have some radioactive elements produced like nickel, uh, and uh, radioactive nickel decays, producing a very characteristic, decays slowly, producing a characteristic light curve. So what you see here is luminosity as a function of time. Uh, nickel goes into cobalt, and then cobalt goes into iron. And just uh, by, when, you when we measure type one supernova, we can measure the total luminosity, and we can also measure this light curve. We can measure how this changes, and this tells, uh, this tells us also some uh, chemical properties, and it tells, uh, and allows us to calibrate some things like uh, the amount of dust that we have from the star to, to us, so that we can actually know uh, what is the luminosity exactly. Well, exactly. But with some with some corrections, but I think Kefir uh, ha seems to be a bit more skeptical than I, than I do. Nevertheless, it's, it's very complicated to 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 um, to put very small error bars to the estimate of the luminosity because these are complex object, complex objects. That the, I mean, every white dwarf is even if uh, uh, there's a mechanism that allows you to explode only in very under very typical characteristics. All the white dwarfs, they come with different compositions, they come with different partners, so they, they can be, so they are in different uh, environments, so they, there will be always some scatter. But I don't know anything about this scatter, and uh, I don't want to trouble you with that. So let me just uh, write you again, so the, 
the formula you saw from Kefir this morning, the distance as a function of redshift is given by this integral as a function of my parameters, where here I have just used that the omega matter is one. Observations, or these are the yeah, observations of redshift versus this distance, and now we have a prediction which is, has to fit all these points, uh, but we have two parameters to fit. The Hubble constant today, which is the slope of this line, and also uh, the, amount of, the amount of cosmological constant or the amount of matter, which is the same. And uh, you have here the result of this fit. You have a best fit that actually clearly tells you that um, you need some uh, cosmological constant, but also you need uh, a, a, an amount of matter. The universe has to be made of something like 30% uh, of, of matter. Uh, by the way, this, yeah, uh, this critical density can be also computed to be, I think we also saw this in Kefir's talk. Uh, now, that we, now, now that we know Hubble constant, we can compute the critical density or the total density of the universe to be this five <laughs> kilo electron volt per cubic centimeter, which is, mass, so the mass of a proton is, uh, is one GeV, more or less. So this is like 10 to the minus uh, six GeVs in a centi uh, sorry, uh, protons in a centimeter, something like one proton in a cubic meter, something like this. Of the order of one proton in a cubic meter would give you the total, den so that is the typical density of the universe. And 30% of this is in the form of matter. And matter here, uh, you know what it means. It doesn't mean dark matter. It means something that when you expand the universe, it contracts, so it, the density increases by the, by the expansion factor Q. Okay, this is the only assumption that we have made. Good. Sorry. Yep. Does this also lead to a prediction for the value of the cosmological constant or just the energy coming from it? Exactly, yeah. So the, the cosmological constant, the value, of the, de energy, the value of the energy density gives you the value of the cosmological constant. Okay. All right. So that's the famous you know, disagreement bef between the theoretical value and the measured one. So does that, is that related to it? Yeah. And, um, yes. But um, so that, yeah. It, it is a surprise that it's non-zero. Okay. And uh, so, so the thing is that we, yeah. But this is a problem with the cosmological constant. It's a pseudo-philosophical problem. Uh, if I, the problem is that the, this cosmological constant is something like a vacuum. You can understand like the energy of the vacuum. And if you, in particle physics, if we have some idea of, of computing vacuum energies, they, they turn out that to, to be infinite, or they turn out to be of the, of the scale of the dynamical scale of our problems uh, of our dynamics, which is like the Higgs Bev or the QCD uh, vacuum scale, and these things are so much higher than the value that we have found here, and th this is a problem. So this is pretty close to zero. The one you this mentioned. is super pretty close to zero. This is equivalent to a milli electron volt to the fourth power. So the new energy scale that gravity is bringing into the problem, or the cosmological constant, is a milli electron volt energy scale, which is more or less related with the mass of neutrinos. That's why some people have tried to relate uh, neutrino masses with the cosmological constant, but of course, forgetting about the infinite values of the vacuum energy and uh, Higgs and uh, Higgs, you know, the electroweak contribution and the QCD contribution. So, thank you. We can talk more about that. Oh, yeah. Why do, you put a power, why do we put a power, a power four to the <clears throat> mass? If we don't have the power four, then the disagreement is less severe, is it? Okay, can you repeat? You, you said we have to put a power four to the whatever EV the cosmological constant is? Yeah. yeah. Why do we have to do that? Ah, no, uh, so, um, so an, an energy density has units of energy to the four, right? It's energy divided by volume, so it's units of energy to the four. So if I want to translate an energy density into one scale of energy, I can only do the fourth root. Uh, but this is just to say, it, uh, yeah, you see. It's not such an argument. It's just to give you a number. Um, so 
I, I'm not sure how far I'm going to, to get here, but I have to uh, already tell you something about uh, your future lectures of the early universe. Um, so I've already argued more or less that 30% of the energy density of the universe is, oh, I've, I've told you that thanks to this weighting of the universe by measuring the expansion, we can get the 30% of the total energy of the, the, of the universe today is in the form of matter. 70% is in the form of dark, uh, dark energy, which I put, I put here. But now, out of these 30%, how much is variance, how, how much is in, made, uh, is, is in the form of variance, and how much is in the form of this dark matter that I was telling you before, is what we're trying to answer now. Um, so in order to do that, we have to, we have to study the, actually the formation of variance and physics of variance in, which it, in what is called a Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, so, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis is uh, the moment in the universe where the uh, light elements, where, where, the, where the nuclear physics of the Big Bang happens. And essentially, it's when uh, the protons and neutrons left from early uh, stages of the, of the Big Bang, they combined to form helium and uh, heavy elements, right? But uh, you know, that, so these, these nuclear reactions, they typically require uh, mega electron volt energies. So the, the, these are the typical uh, energy, sc energy scales of nuclear reactions. multi k uh, many, well, around, around uh, many, k uh, around mega electron volt scales. Now, you have learned from the previous lecture that, uh, yeah, as, as we move up, as we, as we extrapolate our expansion of the universe, to early and early, early and earlier stages, the wavelength, the wavelength of the cosmic microwave background is decreasing. So this means that the temperature, of the average, which is the average energy of a wave of a microwave photon, increases, increases and increases. So since we know that today the temperature is 2.7 Kelvin, and uh, we know that uh, the typical nuclear reactions that we want to study. Uh, happen at more or less like a 1 MeV or 100 keV energies, which corresponds to something like a billion Kelvin. So we know that we have to compress the universe by a factor of 1 billion to reach uh, to a level in which the temperature of the universe was so hot that we could have this uh, nuclear reaction. So we are going to do that. We are going to compress the universe uh, a million, uh, a thousand million times, and, um, and we are going uh, to get so, yeah, uh, to a stage in which the universe is just a very hot plasma, mega electron volt temperatures, and uh, the only thing that we have around is uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons. The temperature is so high that uh, electrons are ion, uh, so everything is ionized. It's a very simple system. Um, protons, neutrons, electrons, and a lot of photons, a lot of them. How do I know this? Well, I already, we have already found that the, 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 the total matter is something like 30%. Um, so the, 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 amount of baryon, the amount of baryons has to be smaller than this 30%, no? But now, as I go back in time, so the, the energy density of radiation, oh, well, sorry, uh, is, inc is increasing, right? So the, the this is the value to photon ratio. The number of baryons divided by the number of photons stay, uh, stays constant. Okay, well, this, I think Kefir will explain this. Um, but you have, well, but just try to remember that the number of baryons to the, divide, the number of baryons divided by the number of photons more or less stays constant. So we can compute this number today. And this number today we can estimate from uh, what we have uh, learned before. So the, the upper limit to the baryon density, and also the fact that we observe a um, black body radiation, which is the which is the, the, the photons in the universe, uh, and the, the density of photons is just given by the uh, Planck uh, law, and then just putting the numbers from this temperature, I, t I tell you the, the result is um, five times ten to the minus five, the critical density. So omega radiation today in for in the form of photons is five times to the minus five. So this means that um, the, well, the density of photons is really ridiculous. So omega baryon divided by omega photon is uh, 
divided this by this uh, 5, ten, 10 to the minus 5. But uh, this, is the, this is the ratio of energy densities, OK? Each of the variants weights a GeV. So of the ratio of the number densities would be the, ma the energy of each of the constituents. In the case of variants, most of the energy is in the mass. So the mass of a variant ten times the number density of variants. And this is the number of uh, the, the energy density of photons, which is the number of photons multiplied by the average energy of photons, which in, in a thermal, in a thermal uh, spectrum is something like point, uh, uh, yeah, two, something like three, three times the temperature. Okay, and this is such a huge quantity of the order of ten to the four. Not because the number density is. Uh, not because the protons are more abundant. It's this other factor that if you estimate this, <laughs> if you estimate this factor, you get uh, a GeV divided by the, the temperature in electron volt, which is something like 10 to the minus 4, and then this number, which I call eta. Now, this thing here is 10 to the 13. Okay? 10 to the 13. And the ratio of the density is only 10 to the 4. So this means that, uh, I don't know if you, if you get the, 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 the thing. The point is that baryons have more mass nowadays than photons, but not because they are more. It's because one, one proton weights 10 to the 13 times, it has 10 to the 13 times more mass than the average photon of the universe, OK? But when we go back into, well, so and then, yeah. So the baryon density. So and the, and the number of variants divided by the number of photons is conserved, and this, uh, this uh, of this super really small uh, number. So there are plenty of photons, and you will you will hear more about the physics of BBN. I can also uh, discuss more, but the important thing is that um, let me just cut it short because otherwise we will not finish ever. So the idea is very simple. The idea is that in such a so there are few variants and a lot of photons. Uh, so um, once once some uh, nucleus, uh, you have only protons and neutrons. Now, neutrons are unstable. So they have to combine. So the only way to, to, to make neutrons survive until today is to combine them with protons to form a stable nucleus. And the first nucleus that you can form is deuterium. And then from deuterium, you can combine uh, protons and neutrons. You can add more neutrons, and you can grow uh, more and more elements. But baryons, but nucleons are so scarce that you cannot do this uh, by merging two or three nucleons at a time. They have to be two by two. So you have to have two-body reactions. And this forces you to go very slowly in this chain to, to higher values. Essentially, um, OK. Or maybe I have to cut it short. Let me just say that uh, at the end of nucleosynthesis, you just end up with uh, some helium some deuterium and some other amount of uh, elements. I have to, I have to be fast. Um, and the, and the final amount that you get of, of helium and uh, deuterium and all these things uh, uh, corresponds very basically to the same to the to the to a very simple idea. Uh, you know that uh, the highest uh, binding energy per nuclear, so the most stable, so the, the, the yeah. A nucleon would prefer to be always in a, in a nucleus of uh, iron because it has the largest binding energy per nucleon. So, right? So, you can, if you put a lot of nucleons together and you give them enough time and conditions, you will form iron. And um, the, the reason is that this is the lowest, yeah, the lowest energy state of a nucleon is forming iron. So, if you, this is <coughs> my protons and neutrons here in the early universe, they want to combine to form iron, because it's energetically more favorable when, when you, the temperatures are lower. But they have to do it only by stages. They combine protons and, and to deuterium, then helium-3, then helium-4, and so on. The problem is that it's very com uh, the cross-sections for producing anything uh, heavier than uh, helium are super, super, super suppressed in this environment. So essentially, the highest, uh, well, essentially the most important heavy element that you can form is helium. So now you can understand more or less why uh, the output of BBN, the, the output of these reactions, 
depends with the baryon density. It depends with the number of baryons divided by the number of photons. If I have many baryons, these reactions happen more, more efficiently, right? If I have many baryons compared with the number of photons, the reactions will happen more efficiently, and then I will have more efficiently the end of this chain, which means more helium, right, or more heavy elements and less lower elements. So this is exactly what you see in this plot. That you display the amount, so the density of helium, or the, this is the, the mass density of helium compared with the total baryon mass, and this is the number of deuterium nuclei compared with the protons. And you see that as you increase the number of baryons divided by photons, deuterium, so the light, the, the light nuclei decreases, and the heavy nuclei, which is helium, the, the stable element, it is increasing, okay? So now we can uh, actually go to the universe and try to measure what was the primordial helium and primordial deuterium produced just after the Big Bang. This is something very interesting to, to explain, but I don't have uh, a lot of time. And, uh, and you, you get this, essentially these measurements, okay? This white uh, region for deuterium, you can do this for other, um, for other elements. The results are not so spectacular, but the ones that we can trust more are helium and deuterium. And if you just take the, the latest results, you, get, uh, you can actually measure the barium to photon ratio very good. And the barium to photon ratio, since we know the density of photons today, and we assume that the barium to photon ratio cannot be changed, we know the amount of barium today. And this is this quantity uh, that if we just, uh, sorry, is this quantity, which is essentially a 4.4% of the total energy density today. So we know that out of the 30% of the universe energy that is in the form of matter, only 4.4% is in the form of baryons. So this leaves us with a 25% of the total energy density of the universe in the form of something that is not baryons. And we have learned before uh, that this, I mean, we have good evidences for the existence of this matter in galaxies, in clusters of galaxies, and that these things they don't behave like baryons as well. And we, we call them dark matter because they don't emit light. So we got also uh, this, I mean, we, we, can, we have also a good way to think that this is exactly the same amount, uh, the, the same kind of sus substance. Because if you divide, um, essentially this 4.4 divided by this 25, you get more or less the 15% that we got in, in clusters of galaxies, okay? So actually, what, uh, Saying everything again, when you look at global clusters, you see baryon to total mass of order 15%. And here, looking at the expansion of the universe combined with Big Bang nucleosynthesis, you also find the same ratio. So probably the dark matter that is in global clusters is precisely the, ma the matter that contributes to the expansion of the universe and is not baryons. Everything fits, right? And you will be presented many times with this cosmic pie that you will have in the notes, which represents essentially the same, and with uh, some uh, extra uh, information. So I think uh, I, perhaps I should, I should cut here. I wanted to explain so much more, but uh, yeah, I will, I will do it better <laughs> tomorrow. Thank you.